we're supposed to come up the mountain. I love this. I built this slide, by the way. That's all put in. It's pretty. Nice job, yeah. And uh, he said, and Moses, hey, I want you to come on up here. <coughs> Moses is going to be the guy that's going to go all the way to the top, come up further. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. Otherwise, they would have been kind of um, probably eliminated, maybe, huh? Okay, let's see what happens. Three to eight. Moses spoke, wrote, and read. Steve. So... So, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he <coughs> sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said, we will do, and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Okay. So we've got words, words, words. And Moses uh, did this with the covenant. This is what he did with the covenant. He spoke the words in verse 3. Uh, he wrote the words in verse 4. And he read the words in verse 7. And we'll see how those kind of connect together here. But I want you to get an idea about this because these, this is like important, okay? Um, verse 4, is that right? It says he, he, oh, verse 3, he spoke the words. Verse 4, he wrote the words. Does your, does your Bible say that? Moses wrote the words. What language do you think Moses wrote in? Hebrew. Okay, probably did. English. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, this is this is important to know. This is an important thing that if that it, you, you have to pull this out from between the lines. Okay, but God dictated these words to the, on the mountain. 22, 21, 22, 23. Okay, He dictated those words on the mountain. That was the made up the covenant after the Ten Commandments, and then God uh, taught Moses the use of letters. I'm not making this up. This comes from a highly um, I can't quote you the name of the article, but it was a highly regarded Jewish article. At any rate, Moses taught the Israelites these letters. Moses, God taught Moses the use of the letters. The Hebrew letters, you just told me, right? Okay, and Moses taught the Israelites these letters. Is this why, 4,000 years ago, the Jewish people are amongst the most brilliant Educated people, I guess my son the lawyer, you know, right? My son the doctor, right? Mm -hmm. They're brilliant people because they're amongst the first people who had the al alphabet in the entire, entire world. Right? Okay, I'll show you here in just a minute. From the Israelites, these letters traveled to Greece and then to other nations. Very few people will attribute the fact that is the Israelites are the first to have the al alphabet. As soon as God separated a people, he governed them by a written word. Doesn't that make sense? God governed them by a written word. Before we had a country, we had, I mean, before we became a people nation here, right? We had a constitution, and it took several, several years for, us to, for the guys to come up with that. But we had something, it's called the rule of law, that we're governed by. And it's based on, based on the Torah. Did somebody say? I said mostly. Mostly, yes. That's the way it's supposed to be, right? We're going back there. That, yes, ma'am. There's not a documentation here in the footnote in this Bible. Uh -huh. It says up to this point only hieroglyphic languages existed, but it wouldn't have violated the second commandment to write the Torah in etched pictures of animals. So Yahweh states here that he wrote the first alphabet. Miles? Miles? 
at old Miles yeah. Jones. Yes. He's, Miles Jones is the same guy who found the, uh, the, the or interpreted the footprints that are all around Saudi Arabia. Right? Miles Jones, same guy. Important man. And, and you're absolutely right. Here we go. Because up until this time, they were living in Egypt for 200 years. This is what they wrote in. So you can see what Vicky's talking about. There's images there. It was a picture language. That's why it's called hieroglyphics, I guess. And they, so they didn't write in words, they wrote in concepts, right? Okay. Now, so here's the first, as far as I, I think this is right, the first Paleo-Hebrew alphabet looked like this. Do those look like animals and birds and snakes and things? No, they don't, do they? They were, sim they were symbolic, so... Um, there's, there's the corresponding one to our, uh, our English alphabet, alphabet as much as possible. There you go. It's called Paleo-Hebrew. Okay? So this is what God gave to Moses up on the mountain. Moses is writing this down. Actually, he's writing it down this way, probably. Right to left. In one other thing I'd point out, not only, I think there's like 22 letters in yep. the Hebrew language, but each letter has a numeric value, one through whatever. So if you take even what it says, like, you know, you'd hit Bob it would have a number and you could add that up. So that's another thing. Yeah. The numeric value mm -hmm. of their alphabet. That's exactly right. Yep. Letters and, and numbers both. Well, oh, sorry. So, so it's proven that your IQ... You're talking about my IQ? <laughs> your IQ. <laughs> Everyone else's IQ. Increases the more, the more, um, I don't know how to say it, the more things you do at the same time. Multitasking? Multitasking? Well, yes, so... Yes, so when when God gave Moses those letters and said these are these are sounds, but they're also words and they're also numbers and they're also concepts. So that means mm -hmm. they could he's got four things going on at the same time, plus he's writing them, plus he's reading them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's six things going on at the same time for him and for anybody who writes Hebrew. There you go. So that's building their intellect, right? Yes. It's playing into their intellect, which is which is one reason I believe, which is plus the writing from right to left on top of it all. So, so <laughs> I believe goes. that is what's building their intellect. That's why you see the Jews, because they're the most obvious group right now, winning all the these Pulitzer prizes and, and, and Nobel Peace they're, Prizes. They're, yeah. You know. Yeah. Stuff, oh, yeah. Because they're they they develop their intellect. Just by writing their own alphabet. Ours just is sounds. Our letters are just sounds. Which is fine, but it doesn't do this. It doesn't do that, yeah. This is concepts and everything. So the short Pic story is... Mental pictures? Who writes in Hebrew? <laughs> so, now, does this tell you what they were doing out in the, in the wilderness for 40 years? They were going to school, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Interesting stuff. Okay. Pillars, in verse uh, 4, talks about pillars were to represent the people and the other, who are the other party to the covenant, right? They were set up over and against an altar. And uh, Moses is the mediator passed between them. And each tribe was to set up its own pillar. That's why there's 12. And Moses then appointed uh, sacrifices to be offered upon this altar. So here we go. This should help us understand a little bit what's going on. That's what I'm trying to get to. Verse 3. <clears throat> Moses came and told the words of yod heh vav uh, and all the judgments and the people said, all the words we will do. He told the words and they said we'll do those words. Here and do. Here and do. Okay. There's, that's verse 3. So this kind of becomes like a little, like a puzzle piece connection. I, I want you to think of it this way: this part, this piece over here is uh, verse three, and this piece over here is the final piece, is verse seven, 
and the pieces in the middle, obviously, what, do you, what verses do you think those what might be? Four, five. Four, five, and six. Very good. Four, five, and six are going to draw this all, are going to draw verse three and verse seven all together. What in the world are you talking about, Miller? Okay, here's verse seven. So Moses came, verse 3, Moses told the words, and the people said yes. And then in verse 7, he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people, and they all said, all that the Lord has said, sure enough, will be obedient and do it. Okay? So verse 4, 5, and 6 here which must have been when he was writing them down. Sure enough, he was writing it down in verse 4. Okay? Here's pillars. These are actual, they're probably the pillars from way back when. Twelve stone pillars and, and he built an altar at the foot of the mountain with the twelve pillars. And then he's going to have, it mentioned in verse 5, there's going to be a burnt offering in Hebrew that's called an olah offering and it totally goes up to God. You kill the animal, take the blood out, whatever, but the animal itself is totally burned and goes up to God. It's a burnt offering. It's referred to in the Bible as a pleasing aroma, a gift to Yahuwah. He's the only one who gets any part of that offering, the burnt offering. Remember that, okay? And then the other offering was a peace offering. Shal is shalem. I don't want to say shalom, but in the Hebrew it's shalem. Uh, and this, the shalem offering, the peace offering, is the only offering that an Israelite was, was allowed to partake in. Okay, so what's the big deal about that? Okay, so what? So here's the big deal. Moses took half the blood and put it in the basins, and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled then on the altar. Okay, yuck. Watch what happens here. I've got, I've got a burnt offering up here, a pitcher, and a, burnt, uh, a peace offering over here. This is in verse 6. Moses takes the blood of both offerings and mixes them together. If you watch the thing, I think it happens. It would be a drop of blood coming out of somewhere. Peace offering. Oh, there you go. And uh, life is in the blood, and this blood cements the, cov the covenant between God and his people. This is a picture of the intermingling of the life and soul of God with his people. Okay, through the blood, because it's a blood covenant. Okay. It represents his life source splashed on the altar of the earth. And did not Yeshua splash his blood on the altar? I mean, on the earth when he was here? Yes, he did. Um, comes another drop of blood. So this blood, the life is in the blood. And the blood is put in the bowl. And the bowl was mixed. And he spread, he, he, uh, spread half of, he put half of it on the altar. Let's see what he does with the other half. So Yeshua backs this up um, at his last supper with his people, with his guys, and he said he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Okay? Here's a picture. Then he took the book of the covenant after he did the altar thing and, and the blood thing. He took the book of the covenant and then he read it to them. Okay, he told it, he wrote it, now he's reading it to the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said we will do, and we will be obedient. So they're confirming this even, okay, in verse 7. Okay, here's a word about uh, burnt and peace offerings. Uh, an altar, he sent young men to go do this. The Ola, once again, is the burnt offering. The Shalem is the peace offering. And up until this point in time, Uh, all of the entire nation of Israel were to be a nation of priests for, for, to him. Everybody was supposed to be able to do this. They didn't have a Levitical priesthood up until this time. They didn't have a Levitical priesthood at this time because they hadn't had the golden calf yet. The nation hadn't messed up yet. So they were all, he says, you're to be a kingdom of priests to me, right? So these are the only two kind of offerings there even were. What other offerings are we going to come in contact with after the golden calf incident? Well, watch here. 
we're going to come in contact with the sin offering and the trespass offering. Wow. We didn't even have those before then. Okay. We have them. Um, okay. So he says, all right, so what are we going to do with this peace offering? Let's find out. They're going to have dinner with God. How would you like to go to God's mountain for dinner? I'm going to have dinner with God? Yeah. I'm sure the meat will be great, right? <laughs> Let's find out 9 and 11. Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. Oh, wow. And there was under his feet, as if it were paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. On the nobles of, he did not lay his hand. Okay? He allowed those people. It was like a special, I don't, what do you call it? Special dispensation. How's that? Is that yeah. Appropriate word? Special dispensation. You guys come on up here. And, you know, if you didn't have this special dispensation, they probably would have been fried. They would have become a burnt offering, I would imagine, <laughs> unto themselves, right? Okay, so Moses was told to go to the top alone, and the representatives were to go, Moses was supposed to go all the way up here. Representatives were supposed to go halfway up here, and the people were not to go beyond the pillars. Keep those people. Remember back in 20? He said, get down and make sure those people don't come beyond the pillars. It's all, it's all kind of a one-story thing. And our brains, when our Greek brains, our American Greek brain that reads from left to right, insists that oh, that doesn't make any sense because back in 20, did a, no, it's all happening at the same time. I got to put it into words so you can understand it. You can get the gist of this. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, all right. But this is all kind of happening at the same time. So the people were about to go beyond the pillars. And this is laid out. Look at this. Holy, holy of holies, holy. And the courtyard, just the way the tabernacle is going to be is going to be laid out. People could come into here, only the priest could go behind here and into this first room, and only the high priest could go into the into the holy of holies in the back. Level three. Level three. <laughs> Sorry, you don't have clearance to go in there, except you guys do have clearance now to go in there because of the blood, because of the blood covenant, because. Yeshua fulfilled the covenant. That's why we don't have a tabernacle. That's why we don't have a temple. That's why I don't want you guys sending any money to anybody to build a third temple. Don't help them. <laughs> you are the temple. Put it into your health. Put it into your health, yeah. Spiritual empathy. Yes, there you go. <laughs> Three zones. Holy of Holies, Holy Place, and the courtyard. Yeah, just like that. Up. Okay. Uh, come on up here, follow the yellow brick road, and it's because it's going to look a little bit like this. Okay? Look at that. I can't, I, can't, I can't even imagine. They saw his feet, and it was as though he was standing in, uh, on sapphire stone. What do you think the Ten Commandments were made of? The first, the first one? Huh? Sapphire. sapphire stone, absolutely. Made of sapphire stone. The first ones. And they kind of got broken. And then he said, <laughs> well, we'll find out about, we're going to find out about the fact, have you ever had your heart broken? Yeah. If you ever had your heart broken, you know what it feels like. It physically, you can physically feel it. God had his heart broken. He knows what, you, he knows, he knows what it's like. Man, his people broke his heart. And we'll talk about that in the next, in the next few weeks. You're going to be surprised what you guys are going to be doing in the next few weeks. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> you guys are going to be teaching a lot of this. Anyway, we'll get there. Um, we're going to have a covenant meal um, with God by the representatives of the people. This is really important. This is one of these uh, kind of covenant meals that is a, it's called a suzerain. Suz suzer I, I looked it up and I listened to it several times. Suzerain, I think is the name, how you pronounce it. 
and we write about this in our in our book. If you ever you guys ever read it, it's written about in the book. Uh, it represents the vassal, uh, a vassal nation. Moses is the leader, Aaron and his sons, and the priests and the seventy people. It represents that kind of a kind of a, a um, covenant. It's a su suzerain, su suzerain covenant. It's the kind of covenant meal that uh, seems to be occurring in Genesis 14.8, also in Exodus 18.12, and of course the Passover, the Lord's Supper. So a Cersanti covenant, a Cersanti, yeah, that's the noun, is any kind of a relationship in which one region or polity controls the foreign policy and relations of a tributary state while allowing the tributary state to have internal autonomy. So tell me what that means. That's almost like legal speak. That's legal speak. That's exactly, yeah, it's from definition off the legal speak. So this is the kind of covenant that they have. God is going to allow his people to have internal uh, autonomy, but they're going to be a vassal of him. But that's okay because he's their God. Are you a vassal? Are you God's vassal? Are you his representative? There you go. And, there, and you have certain things that you're going to, you've agreed to do, okay? And, he, and we're certainly going to control his foreign policy. Things like, oh, I don't know. This is just a generic uh, definition. But things like, it fits. But things like, don't make any covenants with any other gods. Right? That's controlling foreign policy. Right? You're going to be responsible for your behavior. You're going, to, you're going to be responsible. You're going to be responsible for following those Ten Commandments. You be responsible. He's not going to make you. You're agreeing to do that, right? Are you yawning? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, what did they eat? This is the peace offering. This is the dinner that they had there. And uh, I don't know what they had. They probably had oxen. I imagine it was a peace offering. I think that's what they sacrificed. So what beef, it's what's for dinner, right? Okay. Um, so this is important too. When a burnt offering and a peace uh, sacrifices, when they're offered together, when they're done together, when they're mingled together, that blood got mingled together, uh, it implies a two-way relationship between God and his people. Remember, God is the only one who gets the burnt offering. And the, and the peace offering is the only one that the children of Israel get to partake in. And God would get the fat from the peace offering. So they're mingling their, these, these sacrifices together. Okay. So the people offer the Ola, the burnt offering, and Yahuwah reciprocates, allowing the people to partake of the meat of the, of the uh, peace offering. And um, <clears throat> so he's allowing them to enter this holy space. God sees and, and see the God of Israel, at least his feet, on the pavement of sapphire. And they ate and they drank with God. What, a, what an awesome thing. Sharing this meal is a sign of intimacy, mutual respect, and fellowship. It's kind of like going to a state dinner. State, not steak, state dinner. <laughs> a state dinner. When, when President Trump invites somebody over for a state dinner, that's it's a sign of respect, I guess, right? Um, Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah, you're right. That same kind of a separation, right? No. Um, all the teachings, by the way, all the teachings of the wedding feast of the Messiah, they're all based on this portion of Torah. When God's judgments on earth are complete and Messiah returns, the righteous are summoned to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Beef, it's going to be what's for dinner, right? All right. Oop. Um, 12 to 18, and then we'll finish up, Steve. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man has difficulty, let him go to them. Then Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses, Out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Okay. That's something that we can just speed, read through and think, well, we got that. Yeah, I got that. Yeah, he didn't. <laughs> uh, Joshua accompanied Moses for a distance, and they waited there for six days. He and Joshua waited uh, half, uh, partway up the mountain for six days, and then Moses went on up. Okay? Um, Moses and Joshua joined the go up a little bit higher. Aaron and Hur are in charge. Oh, this is a great idea. We're going up there. And Aaron, you and her are in charge. So if anybody has any trouble, these 70 elders, if they got any trouble, you go to them and they'll help you. Wink, wink. Okay? I'll remind you, it was her that they went to when they said, we want you to build us a calf because obviously he's not coming back. Right? Aaron really helped out a bunch. Aaron's going to hold his entire family responsible for that for the rest of his life. Okay. Um, Aaron and Hur didn't do a very good job of guarding the camp. As will be, as will be, her, yeah. Aaron and she. No, it's Aaron and Hur. <laughs> That's really funny. Did you catch that? <laughs> should that should be Aaron and she? <laughs> no, it's Aaron and Hur. <laughs> Uh, so I looked it up. I said, who in the world is Hur? And Hur was a guy, uh, he wasn't a relative of Aaron and Moses. He was a guy from Judah. So we got L Levi and Judah in charge of the camp. Is that a prophetic statement? Uh -huh. And uh, so at any rate, they didn't do a very good job. And um, here's kind of, I love this next picture. That's kind of a view from below, right? Verse 15, And Moses went up into the cloud that covered the mountains, and, and three million people were down here. And they're waiting. Three million people can probably wait, I don't know, for six days without their fearless leader. All of Chicago. All of Chicago. Wait. You just wait for six days. Because, I mean, they just had that life-shattering experience, right, with the shofars and the yeah. trumpets and the... And the, heard the voice and the wind. We can wait for six days. Okay. Does the sight of the glory of the Lord um, was like a consuming fire? Yep. Uh, on top of the mountain, and um, so Moses goes up into the midst of the mountain, and uh, he's on the mountain for forty days and forty nights. So if I add six days and I add 40 days and 40 nights, I come up with 46 days. 46 days. That's kind of like divide that by seven and you come up with a little over six weeks, right? Six weeks? Seven weeks. Seven times seven. Yeah, six, about six and a half weeks. Hmm. We have a half a week to go. Huh, we have a half. Isn't that interesting? He's got this private interview with God which lasts for six weeks. Six more weeks. He's there with he's there with um Joshua for six days. And then he Joshua, you stay here. I'm going up into the cloud. 
and I'm going to be gone for a while. You wait here for me, right? And all hell is going to break loose down at the bottom of the mountain, and we'll talk about that in the next couple. This has been a presentation of Fellowship of Messiah with teacher Susan Miller. Video editing by Joel Thompson. If you've enjoyed this video, please like. Click the thumbs up icon below the screen on the left and subscribe by clicking the bell icon below this video and to the right to be notified of each new video we post. Know someone else who'd love this video? Click the arrow pointing to the right in the upper right hand corner of this video and share. Until next time, Shavuot Hov. Have a good week. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you His everlasting peace and harmony in every area of your life. In Hebrew, that is, Yivarekeka Yehua V'yishmarecha Ya'er Yahua P'navalecha V'ikuneka Yisa Yahua P'navalecha V'yasem Lecha Shalom.